Okay, so last time <clears throat> uh, we talked about turning the water to wine, uh, and then we started to talk about, we got about halfway through Jesus cleansing the temple complex. Not going to go back over everything that we talked about last time. Uh, we're just going to jump right back into it. And so where we're going to jump in then is um, verse 18, verse 18 of John chapter 2. So Jesus drives the money changers out of the temple, <clears throat> and then understandably, there's going to be a reaction. I mean, that's what the book of John is all about, right? Jesus does something, and the people react to it in, in some form or fashion. And so the reaction then in verse uh, 18, <clears throat> so the Jews replied to him, <clears throat> what sign of authority will you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, destroy this sanctuary and I will raise it up in three days. Therefore, the Jews said, this sanctuary took 46 years to build and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the sanctuary of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. While he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many trusted in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all and because he did not need anyone to testify about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Okay, so, so the Jews come to Jesus and, and they're asking a question. What gives you the right to do this? What gives you the right to drive all the business out of the temple? And Jesus' answer, I mean, is it a direct answer to, to what they're asking? What, what gives me the right? I mean, he could just say, well, I'm the son of God. This is my house. This is my father's house. And you don't have the right to treat my father's house in this way. He, he kind of already has said that, hasn't he? Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And so really the question has already been answered, hasn't it? By what authority do you do these things? Well, I do them by the authority of my father, whose house this is and whose dwelling place uh, this was meant to be. But the Jews then, so Jesus tells them, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days or destroy this sanctuary. And I think that language is, is, is important there. So the Jews, of course, misunderstand Jesus' meaning, believing him to speak of the physical temple. But there's kind of a subtle uh, differentiation in the language that Jesus uses. So back in verse uh, 14, the temple complex, the building itself, has already been referred to. It's a completely different word than what Jesus uses. Jesus refers to this as a sanctuary, a dwelling place. And, and that's, that's how he referred to it um, as the dwelling place of his father. So he says, destroy this sanctuary and I will raise it up in three days. And so then that, that word also, he doesn't say I will build it up in three days. He says, I will raise it up in three days. And, that, and that's distinct in the Greek as well. Um, so this word raise is going to be the same word that's used when Jesus raises Lazarus. And so it, it has this, um, not just a, a building back up, but also a restorative aspect to it. It's a renewal so taking something that's been broken down, been, been destroyed, and I'm going to raise it back up. And of course, as we read here, he's talking about himself, but they don't, they don't quite get it. But John does tell us, though, that when the disciples reflect on this event, remember, John's being written decades after these events have taken place. And so when John and, and it, any other disciples that might have heard about this are reflecting on this, they remember Jesus said this, and they say, Oh, I get it now. I understand. And, and aren't we lucky that we have the benefit of, of kind of having the whole story there? Um, so really, then, in missing kind of the subtlety of Jesus' vocabulary, the Jews completely miss the point of what he's prophesying. 
which is the answer to their question. The true sign of his authority is he will be resurrected. Can anyone else resurrect the dead? Well, no, at least not without Jesus' authority being granted to them. So my authority is going to be on clear display in that you're going to think that the story is over. And I'm going to prove to you that it's not. So that, that's my authority. Um, and so then the result of this, this interaction and, and kind of the, the after effects of it, as the disciples remember this, is they believe. They believe. Um, verse uh, 22, they believe the scriptures and the, and the statement that Jesus had made. That's the whole point of John's gospel. So now then we have this kind of curious statement right here at the end. So apparently Jesus, this isn't the only interaction that Jesus has had while he's in the temple. They're down there for the Passover festival. There are a lot of people down there. Passover being one of the chief holy days uh, that many would come to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices. And so Jesus is teaching, he's preaching, he's interacting. And the result is many trusted in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. Again, signs is a, a big concept in John. They saw the signs that he was doing. But we get this curious statement in verse 24. Jesus did not entrust himself to them. So, so we're seeing this relationship. Wasn't the goal of the signs for people to believe in Jesus? So why would Jesus not entrust himself to them? What it says, to kind of further clarify... He would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all and because he did not need anyone to testify about man for he himself knew what was in man. Some of your translations may say he, he himself knew what was in man's heart. He knew their hearts. And so John concludes by stating that the faith of the people is not exactly what Jesus was looking for. That's really kind of the indication. I think back to another event in the Old Testament where a sign of God was clearly done in front of the people. And there was no doubt that it was God that was doing it. The instance I'm thinking of is Elijah on the Mount Carmel, right? I mean, the whole point of that particular event where it's Elijah versus the prophets of Baal, and which one is actually going to answer prayer? Well, does God clearly answer the prayer of Elijah at that time? Oh, in dramatic fashion. And the prophets of Baal have been yelling and cutting themselves all day long and nothing, but God clearly acts. And yet, in the very next chapter, Elijah's running for his life, and he's thinking, I'm all alone. Nobody else is following God but me. And so the people believed that God was who he was, and yet that belief was, was shallow. It, it, it wasn't fully established. So right now, the people that are believing in the crowds that are believing in Jesus, their trust and their belief is primarily based on the miracles, the signs. So you see somebody doing a miracle, and you think, okay, I want to follow this person. But it's not based in the teaching. They don't quite have a mindset yet that's really going to attach them to Jesus, that's really going to cause them to seek after him. And so we're really going to see this play out later on as Jesus continues to provide deeper concepts that are difficult to understand. I mean, some of those parables and some of the statements of Jesus really are hard to understand. Um, and what's going to happen is, is those people that followed him to wherever he was are going to start to melt away. He's really going to start to lose followers um, because they decide that his teaching is too difficult or they were simply following him for superficial reasons. They were following him for what he could give them or what he could do for them in the immediate sense. But when he starts teaching and when he starts, more importantly, calling them to follow to the extent that they need to follow, you truly need to understand what it means to follow me. 
And if you can't do that, you're going to drift away. And, and we see that happening. Uh, see that happening. Any closing thoughts on chapter two there? I know we kind of jumped back in right in the middle of it. Okay. Well, let's use that thought here to, to kind of springboard us into chapter three then. So we talked about the seven signs that Jesus did, and we've already seen the first one in the, excuse me, the first half of chapter two, Jesus turning the water to wine. And John says, this was the first sign that he showed to, to show who he is. And we talked about the rest of these, and we're going to see the rest of these as we continue to go through John. Intermixed in between these signs, though, are also what we're going to term seven discourses of Jesus. So they're either speeches of Jesus, sermons of Jesus, or typically, more often than not, they are conversations with Jesus. Uh, Jesus is trying to explain something to someone. Let's skip ahead. Jesus has an inner, somebody has an initial interaction with Jesus. And Jesus gives an answer to the interaction. The people misunderstand what that means. They don't really understand Jesus' initial statement. So then Jesus comes back and he clarifies the statement or he provides more information for the statement. And then there's a second kind of interaction there. And he gives another discourse or explanation. And this pattern is going to play out over and over again as Jesus interacts with folks. This is important because what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to get them to think. He's trying to get them to understand something that's greater than just what they can see at face value. And so when, they, when he says something and he misunderstands it, the point of them having the question about it or being inquisitive is so that they will continue to delve into it. If you think back to the parables class that we did, Jesus will sometimes tell a parable in answer to a question or a situation, and he'll just kind of leave it there. He'll, he'll let it sit. Now, the reaction to that parable is the important part. Does the person say, well, well, that was a weird story. I'm going to go back and go about my day. Or do they go to Jesus and say, can you tell us what this parable means? Can you, can you give us more information about this? So, so what is the true intent of the person that's hearing this? Now, we're going to see this play out in chapter three then. So a man named Nicodemus is going to come to Jesus. He's going to have an initial interaction with him. Jesus' first answer to this person, to Nicodemus, is going to be very unclear to Nicodemus. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And so Nicodemus is obviously going to be like, well, what does that mean? How can a man be born again? We're going to have this initial misunderstanding of Jesus' statement. So then Jesus is going to continue speaking, and he's going to say, unless someone is born of the water and the Spirit... And then he's going to continue on in, in, that, uh, in that explanation. Now, let's, let's go ahead and talk about that. So let's, let's jump right into uh, Nicodemus' conversation. Setting the stage. So we just mentioned the previous chapter ended with crowds believing in Jesus, but it was a misconception of who Jesus is. They're only believing in the miracles. They're, they're not believing in the man. And, and what he's saying. And so Jesus doesn't fully entrust himself to them. They only see what they want to see because they don't understand the nature of the kingdom of God. Now, why do I say that? What were the Jews looking forward to in terms of the Messiah? An earthly king that would do what? Okay, that would rule like an earthly king and overthrow the Romans. They're living under an oppressive nation. Really, they've been living under oppressive nations since the time of the kings. And they want relief. They've read the prophecies. They've specifically read the book of Daniel that talks about these great empires that are to come. 
And which empire, how would they know about the great empires, incidentally? Anything in Daniel talks about empires coming? Come on, guys. The book of Daniel. There's a certain dream about kingdoms. I'm going to make you work for it. Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Please tell me about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Nate. Materials. Okay. Including gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Iron and clay. Muddled down towards the end. Iron, iron and clay. Okay. And then what happens to this statue? He sees it and he thinks about the different materials. Uh huh. And then he recognizes that a rock is cut out that comes down. It destroys the entire statue and becomes a mountain. Okay. So, thank you. So, Nate mentions a statue made of, and specifically he mentions four different types of material, gold, silver, bronze, and iron and clay. Okay. What are those, what are the different materials representing? The different empires. Okay. So, gold is? Okay. Silver, bronze, who took over the Medes and the Persians? The Greeks, that's right. And then after the Greeks came, the Romans. What do you think they're looking forward to based on that dream? The very next thing that happened was the stone came down and smashed that statue. Okay, don't miss what they were looking for. They interpreted these things in a literal sense, in an earthly sense. The Messiah was going to come and obliterate that statue. Now, Rome is the most powerful of them all. If you go and look at a map of these empires, they prog progressively get larger and larger and more authoritative. The Assyrians were cruel. The Babylonians overtook them, and so on and so forth. Rome is the most powerful empire the world has known to date. And, and I would say, really, they're, gonna, they're among the most powerful until Britain really comes. Um, Rome is the most powerful empire in the world to date, and they are under their thumb, and they've been told they are the chosen people of God. So somehow they've got to overcome this kingdom. They're looking for the Messiah. And they believe this Messiah is going to come in on a white charger like Alexander the Great and lead them to glory. Initial misunderstanding. Because they're seeing what they want to see. They're seeing, oh, this man does miracles. Therefore, he's going to lead us with miracles. Is that what Jesus came to do? Well, in a sense, he did because he is the stone. And yet he's not going to do it in the way that they want it. Okay, so the people only see what they want to see because they don't understand the nature of the kingdom of God. They expected the Messiah on their terms rather than the other way around. Now, enter a leader of the Jews who now comes to Jesus. There's a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to him at night. We're reading in John 3. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Now, again, we need to understand something about the background of Nicodemus in order to get this story a little bit more fully. What do we know about the Pharisees? Have we seen the Pharisees in John so far? Have we seen them yet? Yes, we have. Where do we see them? We've only been, we're only into the beginning of the third chapter, so it's not much. We saw them in chapter one, right? John the Baptist is baptizing, he's preaching in the wilderness, and the Pharisees send people out to, out to him to ask questions. 
we can already see there's a bit of an antagonistic relationship happening there because they're asking him the same thing that they just asked Jesus. By what authority are you doing these things? What gives you the right to baptize people and call them to repentance? You're not a priest. You're not a Pharisee. You're not a member of the Sanhedrin. What gives you the authority to, to do these things and teach these things? So the Pharisees then, as a group, they're leaders among the Jews, and they're experts in law, Torah, so the actual law of Moses we have written for us, and in the traditions. In order to keep the law, the Jews came up with these various traditions that weren't necessarily written in Scripture, but they put them on people in order to keep from overstepping the, the law. So they're the ultra conservatives, basically, uh, of the Jews. Nicodemus is one of these people. So does Nicodemus have a, an intimate knowledge of scripture? Let's ask that question. Yeah, he does. This is no fool. This is no, you know, just random bystander. This guy has read the scriptures backwards and forwards. He knows them. Nicodemus is also, he calls him a leader of the Jews. He's also most likely a member of the Sanhedrin. What's the Sanhedrin? The Sanhedrin is basically the Jewish Supreme Court. It's a group of 71 elders, one, the, the additional one being the high priest. It's a group of 71 elders that acts as the ruling council, the Supreme Court of Israel. And so as infractions happen, it's kind of like our court system where an appeal is made to a lower authority and then a higher authority and a higher authority until eventually it comes to the Sanhedrin and they become the final ruling body on whatever the matter is, just like our Supreme Court system. Um, and so Nicodemus is most likely a member of this group. We're going to see him later on interacting with the, the Sanhedrin, uh, and it's probably because he's a part of it. The gospel accounts also characterize the Pharisees not in a positive light. So I've got three examples up here. And lest we consider this to be a generalization, it, it is a generalization, but it's a generalization based on the majority. Because even Jesus will, will say these things. In Matthew 23, Jesus describes the Pharisees telling his disciples, don't be like them. Because he says they do everything to be observed by others. They're status seekers. They're power hungry. They want the people's positive, um, they, they want followers. They want people to look at them and elevate them in high esteem. They love the place of honor at banquets, the front seat in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called rabbi by the people. They like having that standing. Luke 18, Jesus characterizes, remember the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, or the Pharisee and the, yes, the tax collector. And he says, the Pharisee took his stand and was praying like this. And again, he's taking his stand in the sanctuary or in the synagogue. The Pharisee took his stand and was praying like this. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. But what other people is he mentally pointing to? Well, that, that tax collector. I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. Okay, so this isn't about God. This is about me. And then Luke 16, backing up in that same gospel, um, the Pharisees and the scribes, I'm sorry, not 16, 15, the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Luke 15, that then prompts Jesus to teach three parables about lost things and the father's joy at finding them. So uh, most notably, the, the prodigal son, story of the prodigal son is where we get that, okay? Now, Nicodemus is an interesting case. We can assume that Nicodemus is curious about Jesus based on the events at the temple. Jesus is in Jerusalem, so he's in closer proximity to where the Sanhedrin would be, and Nicodemus has either seen or heard about the events that happened in the temple. So he comes to Jesus, come to him. How does he come to him? He comes to him at night. Why do you think he comes to him at night? Because he doesn't want anybody to see him. He's afraid of what his peers are going to think about him coming to this man that's ranting and raving in the temple complex and overthrowing all the, the, the status quo, really. 
Okay, so Nicodemus, this man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. So in contrast to the scorn of the Jews in chapter 2 and verse 18, where they're saying, What's, what authority do you have to do these things? Nicodemus is at least saying, you are a teacher with some authority. So we realize that the things that you're doing, God has got to be with you in some form or fashion. And I want to understand more about this. I want to give you the benefit of the doubt, as opposed to just directly condemning you. So Jesus answered to him then. Let's just read through uh, the first part of John 3, and then we'll come back and parse through it, okay? So chapter 3 and verse 3, Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But how can anyone be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can these things be? asked Nicodemus. Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied. I assure you, we speak what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about things that happen on earth and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about things of heaven? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. All right, let's stop right there before we get to the money verse, right? Okay, so let's work through some of these things. Jesus' initial answer then to, to Nicodemus coming to it. Nicodemus hasn't even asked a question yet. Keep that in mind. But consider the response in light of the first statement that Nicodemus makes. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, we know that you are a teacher from God. Now that word know, remember we've said before, there are two versions of the word know. There's the word eidos, which means to see or perceive. It's an observation. And there's the word genosko, which means to understand, to come to a deeper grasp of something. This is the word eidos. Teacher, we see, we can see, we can observe that you have come from God because we're observing your works. And so then Jesus' reply to him then is, unless someone is born of the water and spirit, he cannot, some of yours will say, um, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's the same word. Unless you're born of the water and spirit, you're not truly going to make an observation. You need to, you need to be able to see. So Jesus is using Nicodemus' own vocabulary to make a larger point. He's not seeing the bigger picture yet. And he says in his response then, born again. Now, let me ask you this. Does anybody have another translation than born again? It's probably going to be a newer version. Does anybody have a newer, uh, a different translation than born again? Is there a different word there than again? Uh, in verse three. What is, what does it say? Okay, so that one says born again. Anybody else? Any others? Everybody says born again. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. All right. Some, some newer translations, and I'm not, so, I'm not elevating one over the other. Some new translations have rendered this unless someone is born from above. Because that's, that's really what this word conveys. Um, this word is used in, in a couple of different, and we're not going to parse out all the Greek, but this word is used in, very, in, a, in a few instances in the New Testament. And it can mean either again, as in something happening for, a, for another time, 
or it can also refer to something from above. John is going to use this same word three, two or three more times throughout his gospel, and it's always translated in those other places from above. In particular, John chapter 3 and verse 31, so down uh, further in this chapter, he's going to say, he, John speaking here, the one who comes from above, it's the same word, the one who comes from above is above all. And then later on in the gospel, um, Jesus is speaking to Pilate, and he's going to say, the authority that you have was given to you. You would have no authority unless it was given to you from above. Same word. So, new, okay, so the NEV. From above, okay. And that's, that's a newer rendering, yeah. What's that? CEV. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and again, I'm not trying to elevate one translation over another, but the reason I say this is because if you think about it in that way, the rest of what Jesus is going to say makes a lot more sense. Now, Nicodemus, he, he, he hears this as again, because he asked the question, well, how can somebody be born again? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so um, really, it'd be, it could be translated either way, but the one who comes from above, from above is, is generally the way that, that uh, John has been translating this. I have to move fast here. Okay, so Nicodemus asked that question. And so we have this initial misunderstanding. How can a man be born again? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus has an earthly understanding of, of what Jesus is, and he's very confused by that understanding. So Jesus then clarifies, truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, now look at what he says. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is using Nicodemus's vocabulary again. So in the first instance, he said, one cannot see the kingdom of God because Nicodemus said, we see that you are a teacher. Now Nicodemus has said, how can one enter into his mother's womb again? And Jesus says, unless you're born of the water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Don't miss these things, guys. Get into this. The, the well is deep. Okay. So uh, he's also going to use a term here that, that has some significance and that we haven't seen yet in John. It's all through Matthew, but that we haven't seen yet in John, the kingdom of God. Now, we just talked about Daniel a few minutes ago and that statue. Well, the wording there in Daniel is, in the days of those kings, that would be the kings of iron and clay, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. That will never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So that phrase, the kingdom of God, it's, it should be chiming alarm bells in someone who's a student of the scriptures and, and of the Old Testament and the prophets like Nicodemus. So as we said, every Jew is looking for that to be accomplished militarily by the Messiah. But Jesus is conveying a grander plan. God's kingdom is not earthly. The way to recognize that kingdom, to see it, and the way to be a part of it, to enter into it, is to be reborn through the water and the spirit. What does that mean? What is being reborn in the water and the spirit? Well, first of all, let's understand that the concept of rebirth is not completely foreign in Jewish thought. Okay, so in Exodus chapter 12, God provides for Gentiles to be a part of the Jewish nation. They weren't completely excluded. They could become what's known as a proselyte. They could take on Jewish customs. Primarily, they had to be circumcised. They keep the Jewish feast days, and they are allowed to be a part of the community of Israel. And what the Talmud says, Talmud is the, we talked about the traditions a minute ago. It's a collection of the traditions and sayings uh, of the Jews. What the Talmud says is one who has become a proselyte, has gone through this process, is like a child newly born. So they already have this concept of, of rebirth. It's a new life happening. So let's 
Let's look at something also, though, that God said in the Old Testament about the restoration of his people in, in terms of this water and spirit imagery. So in Ezekiel chapter 36, I know we're jumping around a lot, but this is what Jesus does. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 through 28, this is the chapter right before the Valley of the Dry Bones. God says to Ezekiel, I will, or through Ezekiel, I guess, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. So both of those images that Jesus has just mentioned, water and spirit, are present in what he's already said through the prophets. Now, water, let, let's kind of use these two images to, to clarify this rebirth that Jesus is trying to get across to Nicodemus. First of all, it's water. Now, we understand this. We generally understand this to refer to baptism, right? We've already seen baptism happening. John came, John the Baptist came. He's baptizing people for repentance. And then right after this, Jesus' disciples are going to start baptizing as well. So this water baptism as a means of renewal is already happening. In the context of the Ezekiel passage, though, water is a purifying agent. It's a cleansing agent and removes, as, as uh, we see there in Ezekiel, it removes uncleanness. Now, again, to a Jew, that word unclean doesn't refer to dirt. It refers to impurity. And so he says, I'm going to sprinkle you with water and get rid of and purify you, get rid of that impurity. So it's of water, but the baptism is also of the spirit. Remember, John already said of Jesus in chapter one, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. There's something different about the way Jesus will baptize you and bring you to renewal. And so again, going back to that Ezekiel passage then, the Spirit is going to cause the change in the one being redeemed. What he says there in Ezekiel is the Spirit is going to soften the heart in order to open it to God's perfect will. Okay, so unless you're born of the water and Spirit, unless you are purified from a sinful past and your heart is softened to accept what now needs to come into it, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus' cryptic answer here just has layers upon layers. We could, we could spend all month on John chapter 3, uh, but we're not going to. Okay, Paul writes about both of these elements later on in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness. Now, pause on that point for just a second. What did the Pharisees believe was going to get them into heaven? Works. Works that they had done of their own righteousness. They're self-righteous. My works are going to make me worthy of heaven. Paul says, the goodness of the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, water and spirit. It all connects. Okay? Whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We cannot checklist God into, salva into our salvation. This is grace. So Jesus then continues. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So Jesus is talking about the work, has just been talking about the work of the spirit. And without the spirit's interaction, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Now he's going to give an example. He's going to kind of compare the spirit to something that Nicodemus might understand. First, we need to see 
some wordplay happening. Again, some verbiage happening here. The word for spirit and the word for wind are the same word. Pneumos. Also the word for breath, uh, breathing, is, is also the same. It's, it's the word from which we get pneumonia, right? Pneumos. Okay, so uh, Jesus intentionally using this word. Now, consider then that the Pharisees are, are concerned with self-justification. We just talked about that. And what can be seen by men? The Spirit's renewal, though, is not something that can be seen as it happens. Now, I want you to think for just a second. If you have been baptized into Jesus Christ in the water and the spirit, you made that confession, you went into the water, you went down, you came back up. Besides being cold because you just went in water and came back up into the air, did you feel anything happening other than hopefully unbridled joy? No. I mean, you didn't get any sort of like tinglies or like a, a halo, like in the Roman or in the Greek paintings or whatever, you know, you didn't feel anything. And yet something happened. And you believe that something happened and it continues to happen. You just couldn't feel it in a, in a physical sense. That's what Jesus is saying with this using the spirit as the wind. Listen, you feel the effects of the wind. You feel the air moving across your skin. You see leaves blowing and trees moving and what the wind can do. Can you actually see the wind though? No, you can't. I mean, we can see molecules and we can see weather radars and all this kind of thing, but we can't actually see the wind. It's, it's not something we can, we can physically see. And yet we experience it. And what Jesus says is, you don't know where that wind came from. Have you ever thought about that? Like, where does wind come? I know people have the whole theory about a butterfly flaps its wings in China and it causes a hurricane over here. But that, I don't think that's how that, that's not science. Uh, but we don't know where the wind comes from. And then once it passes by, I don't know where it's going. Georgetown, maybe? I don't know. So that's what Jesus says. The spirit is working and you're going to feel the effects and you're going to see the effects of that work happening, but you're not actually going to know how it happens. Think about in terms of birth, human birth. We argue a lot these days because of the abortion debate on when life begins. No matter when you think life begins, it's mind boggling to think what makes something truly live? What makes something a conscious being versus just being a rock or a tree or something like that? You ever thought about that? It's kind of one of those like deep thoughts. You don't know how that happens. And no matter how much science we can get into about electrical synapses and brain activity and all those things, we don't actually know what causes something to live initially. And none of us can cause something to live. We can put together ingredients and things like that, but we can't actually make something live. How does God make man live in Genesis? Through the spirit. He puts the spirit of life and he breathes the spirit of life into him. Okay. So the spirit is working and you, you don't understand it, but it's happening. So Nicodemus is going to ask the question, how can these things be? Jesus, I'm just not getting it. And his question really seems not so much incredulous, but inquisitive. He may see the necessity of Jesus teaching, but not really the means by which it's accomplished. And so Jesus is going to ask him a really hard question here. Are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? How can you be presuming to teach all of the people and have them look to you as an example, and yet you're not getting the work of the Spirit and what he's doing? I'm teaching you something that's going to give you a deeper level of understanding, not in any sort of mystical sense, but in a sense that you need to understand in order to truly understand how the Spirit is working in you and how God's plan is going to take place. Because more things are coming that you're going to say, how can this be? How can this be the plan that God had? And so Jesus 
gives uh, another part to this. And it, it's kind of one of those things you read it and you're like, wait, wait a minute, what? We speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen. Well, that raises a couple of questions for me. First of all, who is the we? Nicodemus is talking to Jesus. Presumably, they're just there one-on-one. I don't know. His disciples might be with him. I don't know. But he and Nicodemus are sitting there having a one-on-one conversation. Who's the we that Jesus is talking about? And, and I think, again, Jesus is using Nicodemus's own vocabulary. When Nicodemus first came to him, he said, we know, Nicodemus is by himself, we know that you are a teacher that come from God. And, and the we there is the people observing Jesus, presumably. Jesus though, says we, and most of your translations probably capitalize the W in we, and so again, you're, you're probably wondering who is the we. Whomever it is, that we is contrasted with the Pharisees. I believe, and we can debate this, I believe that Jesus is talking about himself and the Spirit. First of all, the Spirit is the nearest antecedent there from verse 8, um, and while much of Jewish religion uh, at this time has really been, uh, well, I'm not going to go into that. Jesus and the Spirit speak based on what is from above. And so he's saying the things that me and the Spirit do, what we see, what we observe and we know are different than what you see and you know. But you don't accept our testimony. The Spirit and I are speaking to you but you're not accepting it. You Jews. And the you there is plural. It means y'all. Y'all are not accepting this. Um, and so that was the second bell, wasn't it? Okay, we'll go into this next time. But his answer then, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven. And then he's going to give an example from the Old Testament. I want you this week, read through John 3 multiple times. And try to see it from this perspective as Jesus not saying born again, but born from above. And then let that be the magnifying glass for the rest of the chapter. Now, some of your Bibles are going to separate between verse 15 and verse 16, as if verse 16 is either a separate conversation or not part of a conversation at all. Verse 16 is a clarification. It's the conclusion of everything that came before it. So when you're reading through multiple times, connect all of this together. See the second part as the conclusion, the culmination of the first. And then we'll come back next week and talk about it. Thanks a lot.